Coming up on today's podcast, the end is near for ISIS. Again? We're going to take a deep dive into what's going on in Syria today and more. It's Tuesday, December 18th, 2018, and you're in the Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hi there, I'm Chuck Holton. Sometimes it feels like deja vu all over again. We've been hearing that ISIS is on the ropes for years now. And it seems like every military in the world has been engaged in defeating that brutal terror organization. Now, I was there in early 2016 when ISIS was pushed out of the northern Iraqi city of Sinjar. And I want to show you what that was like, because this story will help you understand a little better what we've been up against. When the Islamic State pushed into northern Iraq in 2014, most of the ethnic Yazidi residents of the area were forced to flee. In November 2015, Kurdish Peshmerga forces were able to recapture a portion of what they'd lost, including Sinjar, a city that was once home to half a million people. But the fight rages on. The Peshmerga may have driven their enemy out of Sinjar, but ISIS isn't giving up so easily. On the new front line, Peshmerga soldiers are living under daily low-grade attacks by snipers and indirect fire. So it's about 8.30 in the morning. It's a beautiful morning. Uh, the sky is incredible. The, the birds are chirping. And ISIS has been shooting at us all morning. Just uh, sporadic fire, mortar rounds coming in from that direction and landing over here in the center of the city. Uh, also, we've had just sporadic. So there's, there's a couple of mortar rounds right there. Now, that means we've got about 15 seconds before we find out where they're going to land. And they've been landing over here in the center of the city. But it's a, it's a kind of scary feeling because you don't have any control over where they're going to land. And if they land right here, it's game over. Oh, you hear it? There it goes. Landed over this way. So these Kurdish soldiers that are holding the front line here in Sinjar... They have to put up with this constantly. It's not really intense fighting. It's just very low-grade fighting most of the time. Once in a while, there'll be an attack, but uh, it's mostly sniper fire and this indirect fire that they have to worry about. We've come here to see evidence of an attack ISIS made recently employing chemical weapons, a form of warfare that most nations have banned for more than 100 years. We traveled to a field just outside the village where the front line is today, and were careful to stay upwind from the site of the attack. On the 11th of February, ISIS fired over 30 mortar shells from off here to my left into this village, now being held by Kurdish forces. And the, the shells didn't explode like normal mortar shells would. Instead, they released a white gas. And I'm here over a week after the attack, and even right now, there's a very pungent odor of rotten vegetables. That's indicative of a mustard agent. And you can see some residue here from the explosion uh, that has this black tar substance on it. And uh, I, I think this is pretty serious. The Kurds thought so. They came out here and covered up the craters made by the mortars because uh, this stuff is still highly toxic, very dangerous. When they went off, we could see the white smoke in the distance. CBN first learned of the attack from my friend Dave Eubanks, who heads a humanitarian group that was here giving medical training at the time of the attack. When the attack happened, we were on the front line training Peshmerga right down there. We heard about it. We came here, and what we saw were shell craters with black tar all around them and stinking and reeking. So we tried to stay upwind of them. And these 120-millimeter mortar rounds. And then we began to talk to some of the patients who had a hard time breathing. They were constricted in their throats. Their noses were burning. 30 people sick right away. Now over 175 people sickened. We went to meet the doctor who treated the victims in the tiny Peshmerga aid station. Fever, vomiting, vomiting, vomiting. Yeah. headaches, headache, diarrhea, diarrhea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And bad breathing, breathing. Yes. D breathing. It's uh, uh, this gas, mm -hmm. upper respiratory system. Upper respiratory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the doctor has, uh, they, they've taken samples of the 
residue from these uh, mortar rounds that came in, and uh, they're waiting for somebody to come and test them. No one has, has come, and they're pretty baffled by that. They're wondering why nobody really cares to come and test this and find out what kind of nerve agent it was. Not long after we left the clinic, one of the soldiers injured in the attack showed up asking for help from Eubanks' medical team. But before they could begin treating him... Oh, gosh. Okay, I go. I'm going to get it. It's very sick. Yeah. Lord, as you heal this man and help him recover. We rushed him to the clinic, where the doctor did his best to treat him, but his condition didn't improve, so he was sent by ambulance to the nearest hospital, more than two hours away. Important test examination. Anybody come here? No, mm -hmm. anybody come here to take test examination? What, what is this gas? We just don't know. Is it chlorine, or is it mustard, or is it something else? And that's why... We need people to come, to come and test this. The doctor was appealing, please come, someone come and test so we know, one, what it is so we can treat our people, two, so we know how to guard against it if we get hit again. As the ambulance was leaving, ISIS started shelling again. We gotta go for the bunker. There's another incoming round. Is that it? That's it, line over here. You gonna get your binos? Yeah. The fight dragged well, on, and someone called an airstrike, while the Kurds fought back with their own weapons. As for the chemical used by ISIS, no one is sure what it is or where it came from. Now the biggest concern is that ISIS could find a way to transfer these weapons into Europe, or even the United States. But for now, the Kurds are doing their best to keep them occupied here. The A-10 just came over and lit up this position. From northern Iraq, I'm Chuck Holt for CBN News. Now, the U.S. trained and equipped SDF forces are close to defeating the last ISIS stronghold in Syria, having just captured the town of Hajin, which is basically the last urban area that was controlled by the terrorists. ISIS is reporting to have several... Uh, hundred fighters left there, but these are the absolute diehards, and many of them are Chechens and other foreigners who have nowhere else to go, and they're going to fight to the last man without a doubt. The march of ISIS into Iraq and Syria has brought untold suffering for millions of people. I'd say that ISIS are the Nazis of our generation, and so I think it's an easy case to make that the blood and treasure we've expended to rid the world of ISIS has been worth it. But once they're gone, there's still much more to do there, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Today, we have about 2,000 U.S. forces on the ground in Syria, mostly special operations, some Marines, and like the 3rd Infantry Division. Now, our guys aren't really supposed to be engaging the enemy directly, but they're there supporting what's called the Syrian Defense Forces, or SDF, which are pretty much made up of Kurdish fighters from the YPG, or as they call them, the Yapaga. Now... The media hasn't done a very good job of explaining the very complicated relationships in that region. So uh, let me try to make it as simple as possible. Everyone hates ISIS, right? And since they took over large swaths of Syria and Iraq back in 2014, pretty much all the players in the region have come in to fight them. You have the Syrian government, which has also been at war with rebel groups in, in Syria since 2012, before ISIS even got a foothold there. Then there are the Americans, who say we're just there to fight ISIS and nothing more, but that's not exactly the whole truth. See, once ISIS is completely routed, and that might happen in the next couple of months, there are a lot of players who have designs on that part of the world. Iran, Iraq, the Kurds, Syria, Russia, and Turkey. So Russia supports Syria. Turkey supports the Syrian rebels who are Arab Muslims against the Syrian government. The U.S. supports the Kurds, which are really our only friends in that region. But the Turks hate the Kurds and are threatening to invade that area where the U.S. and the Kurdish fighters are if the U.S. doesn't make the Kurdish forces lay down their arms, which isn't going to happen. The Russians have been quietly supporting the Iranians, who would love to get some bases closer to the border of Israel inside Syria. 
For their part, the Israelis come in and drop bombs once in a while and obliterate Iranian attempts to build those bases. And the Russians have tried to use mercenaries in the past to attack U.S. forces and perhaps embarrass us or get us to leave. That didn't work out so well and resulted in hundreds of dead mercenaries on the uh, Russian side. Turkey wants the U.S. to leave, too, so that they can have free reign to pound on the Kurds. And if all that wasn't complicated enough, the Kurdish fighters also include some elements of the Kurdish Workers' Party, which is known as the PKK, which has been designated a terrorist group by the United States government. So there's that. So as you can see, the whole region is just a powder keg, and it's real likely the violence is not going to end when the final demise of ISIS comes about. So speaking of ISIS, just because we route them out of their last remaining stronghold in Syria doesn't mean they're gone for good. They're still waging an insurgent campaign inside Iraq, with car bombings and assassinations happening on an al almost weekly basis. Now, add to, add to that the deep-seated animosities which have been nurtured for centuries between Sunni and Shia Muslims, Yazidis, Druze, Turkmen, and others in that region. And you'd be safe to say that on some level, pretty much everyone hates everyone over there. And that's not exactly a roadmap for peace and tranquility. The U.S. needs to keep troops in that region at the moment for the same reason we still have more than 23,000 soldiers in South Korea. They're there to deter powerful bad actors from going after our allies in the region. See, the Kurds are the most reasonable of all the players in that area. And the United States would probably have a permanent base in Erbil if it weren't for the fact that putting one uh, in Erbil would make Iraq mad at us. And we kind of still need to be friends with them, even though they're pretty much controlled by Iran at the moment. See, it's definitely a mess. There's... No two ways about that. Uh, and, and that's kind of like, you know, welcome to the Middle East. So as always, it's the innocents in the area who suffer the most. Estimates are that over 400,000 civilians have died in Syria alone over the last eight years and tens of thousands more in Iraq. More than 12 million Syrians have been driven out of their homes. It's hard to imagine the scale of human misery like that that's affected that many people since World War II. I mean, how do you even begin to help? Millions of those people have fled to other countries, but that's not a viable long-term solution. So like many evil dictatorships, the government of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad will just have to eventually collapse under the weight of its own evil. And the Trump administration's policy should probably be aimed mostly at making sure that that happens. Now let's talk about something a little more uplifting. I want to brag for a, a little bit on my oldest son, Mason. Back in February, he joined the Army uh, with the idea that he was going to become a door gunner on a Black Hawk helicopter. So he's been in training for most of this year through, throughout BASIC at Fort Jackson and advanced at Fort Eustace. And then in September, he got sent off to his first duty station at Fort Bliss, Texas, where he's a part of a medevac unit. He was so fortunate there to get that assignment because my wife's cousin Spencer happens to be a sergeant first class in the same unit. So cousin Spencer has been working super hard to help stack the deck in Mason's favor. Now Mason got lucky again when on Spencer's recommendation, he was selected to attend air assault school. And if you don't know what that is, air assault is a coveted school in the army that qualifies soldiers to do stuff like sling loads and other helicopter operations like rappelling and fast roping. And it's sort of affectionately known as the 10 toughest days in the U.S. Army. It has a dropout rate of over 50%. So Mason had a lot to prove as a young private, given the chance to go earn his air assault wings. Well, Monday morning was his final test, a 12-mile road march in full kit, and it had to be completed in under three hours. Sergeant Spencer got up early to join Mason for the second half of that ruck run and to cheer him on at the end. Nice. <laughs> Can't keep up with this kid. <laughs> Good job, Mason. Needless to say, I'm so proud of my boy and really grateful that Cousin Spencer was there to motivate Mason on to victory. They're slated to deploy to Afghanistan early next year in 2019, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd keep them and their unit in your prayers. And for Mason, I just want to say, air assault, boy. Hua. 
That's all for today, folks. Please give us a like and a share wherever you're watching or listening this podcast. I'm really grateful for the positive response we've gotten after just the first week of this new endeavor. And I'm going to keep doing my best to bring you great content. So stick around. I'm Chuck Holton, and thanks for listening. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.